Response to intervention, or maybe you've heard the term RTI, is a framework that is receiving a decent amount of attention in the field of education today. We will spend the next little bit exploring the fundamentals of the concept and process. Where did it originate? What is it? Why is it important to you as a future educator? And what is necessary to make it work for students and for schools? What is it that we believe about children and students and learning? Take a moment and think about each statement on the slide and if you agree or disagree with each. Then, determine why you believe the way that you do. Is there a particular experience or a set of experiences that have influenced your beliefs about students and learning? Although we have different experiences and views, we all should agree with the statement on the slide. The belief that all children can and do learn has changed our thinking about education in recent years. Most recently, the impact of practice and policy on federal legislation has been seen in the reauthorizations of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 2001 or No Child Left Behind, and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004. Remember that ESEA is the general education law, and along with No Child Left Behind, the both of these provide systems of accountability for states, schools, and students. Both ESEA and NCLB also include provisions for school improvement or expectations for continuous improvement. Districts need to have a plan in place and make actions towards meeting the goals outlined within the plan. Adequate yearly progress, or AYP, needs to be made for all children, including all ethnicity and racial groups, those with low socioeconomic status, English language learners, and students with disabilities. Mandates within IDEA 2004 outline that instruction must be tied to state standards. It must be research-based and delivered by a highly qualified teacher. This gives us confidence that the instruction provided will be effective with a large majority of the students. Also, progress monitoring would occur. Progress monitoring is ongoing assessment that is used to measure students' academic performance and evaluate the effectiveness of instruction. IDEA 2004 also included provisions for intervening early when a student struggles academically or behaviorally. Previously, most would wait until a student failed until services were put in place. Both laws, Elementary and Secondary Education Act and UNCLB, and IDEA 2004 focus on data-based decision-making. There are many ways that IDEA 2004 overlap with No Child Left Behind, many of which aim to close the achievement gaps for subgroups of students, especially those with disabilities. Most notably, connected to our discussion of response to intervention, Today are research-based practices, instruction, and interventions. Both of these acts reference scientific-based instruction, and the earlier interventions are implemented with struggling learners, there are more opportunities for the student to learn skills. NCLB sets forth holding schools, local education, and states accountable for improving the academic achievement of all students and promoting school-wide reform and ensuring the access of all children to effective scientifically based instructional strategies. Regarding IDEA, Congress stated to improve the academic achievement and functional performance of children with disabilities including the use of scientifically based instructional practices to the maximum extent possible. 
Now that we have looked at legislation and foundations behind the RTI process, what is it? RTI is a process that provides all learners with the opportunity to learn. RTI is a general education framework that involves research-based practices for delivering instruction and interventions. RTI is an example of tiered instruction where teachers use various evidence-based pra teaching practices, data collection, and progress monitoring techniques across various instructional settings to determine whether or not students are respond have responded to instruction. In RTI is a framework that elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools use to improve instruction in reading and math, but really can be used for any academic area, including spelling, writing, and science. In most schools, about 80% of students fall within Tier 1. Tier 2 serves about 10 to 15% of students, and Tier 3, the most intensive tier, has about 5%. In Tier 1, teachers are using evidence-based practices to teach the general education curriculum. Students with and without disabilities receive instruction in this tier. Tier 2, either general or special education teachers, provide targeted supports to students who are not making progress in Tier 1. Again, students with or without disabilities. These students receive additional instructional time and different methods for learning skills needed to succeed within Tier 1. Students receiving Tier 2 instruction still receive Tier 1. Students who do not respond to intervention at Tiers 1 and 2 are placed in Tier 3. In Tier 3, students receive intensive, individualized instruction and usually Usually the referral process to special education is started if the child does not have an IEP already. The idea is that if evidence-based practices are being used and progress is being carefully measured, teachers can rule out several reasons why the student may be struggling and hone in on their specific challenges to be matched by specific evidence-based interventions. Here, we'll look at a three-tiered model, often depicted as a triangle, as one example of how a tiered framework can be used as a school-wide strategy for instructing all students. All students will participate in Tier 1 instruction. At this level, they'll receive effective, differentiated instruction provided by the general classroom teacher as part of an evidence-based core curriculum. The evidence-based instruction offered at this level can be expected to meet the learning needs of 80 to 85 percent of all students. For students who don't respond adequately to Tier 1 instruction, more intensive interventions come into play. Tier 2 interventions build upon the differentiated instruction provided at Tier 1 by offering students more systematic instruction and interventions strategically designed to help them catch up in areas of difficulty. These interventions are usually delivered to a small group of students within the general classroom, either by the classroom teacher or by another team member supporting the teacher who has also been trained to deliver the interventions. Tier 2 interventions will be offered to the 15% of students for whom Tier 1 instruction was not sufficiently intensive to meet their specific learning needs. But here is a critical point. Students who receive targeted Tier 2 interventions continue to participate in general Tier 1 instruction. Tier 2 interventions do not replace the core curriculum. They supplement it. For example, Dennis has been selected to receive Tier 2 interventions based on the results of recent reading fluency data. He'll continue to participate in the 90 minutes of core reading instruction that is provided to all students in Tier 1 each day. But in addition, he'll spend another 30 minutes per day receiving targeted reading instruction at Tier 2. Under RTI, his opportunities for learning and for catching up to his classmates will have been extended. We've saved the most intensive interventions available for the small percentage of students who still lag significantly behind their peers in making academic gains. Tier 3 interventions supplement the previous tiers by providing the most intensive evidence-based interventions delivered to individual students or in very small groups. Again, the intensity of instruction at this level increases. The size of student groups is reduced and their opportunities for direct instruction extended. 
Interventions in Tier 3 may be delivered by an intervention specialist or even a special education teacher. But again, these interventions supplement the instruction provided at Tier 1, not replace it. And students do not have to be identified as disabled in order to receive these interventions. Only about 5% of all students will require these intensive Tier 3 interventions. Of these students, only a portion may go on to require special ed services. Here, we'll look at a three-tiered model. Often, Many schools use RTI as their mechanism to identify whether or not a student has a learning disability. Previously, many states used a failure model when identifying students who may have a learning disability. In other words, it wasn't uncommon that a student struggle and fail before supports were put in place. This model is best known as the discrepancy model and we'll address it when we talk about students with learning disabilities. But it's important to note that previous models focused on a discrepancy between IQ and achievement scores. There is much more to RTI than determining whether a student has a learning disability. As students move from Tier 1 to Tier 2 and 3, the intensity of support is increased. Again, Tier 1 is basically the general education classroom curriculum and instruction, while Tier 3 is mostly associated with special education. A common misconception is that the tiers are locations where instruction in the building is occurring. Don't think of tiers as a physical location, but instead think of tiers as a way of referring to the type of instruction that happens. While Tier 2 and Tier 3 may be happening outside the classroom, there's no rule that it has to be. Students can and do move into and out of tiers with fluidity depending on how well they are responding to instruction. These decisions are made by teams including both general and special educators and others such as an administrator, reading specialists, and parents. In some schools, the tiers may exist for numerous academic areas within the school. A student might need Tier 3 instruction for three services. Usually, a school will administer the screening instruments multiple times throughout the year, most often in the fall winter, and spring to ensure that all students are screened and that no one falls through the cracks. For example, my daughter who is in kindergarten was screened by the second week of school. This information helped the teachers identify students who may benefit from additional supports. In addition to identifying students who need additional support in Tier 2 or Tier 3, Universal screening can answer a couple of questions. For one, is the core curriculum working? Does the instruction that teachers are providing to the general education classroom work for the majority of students? And is it effective for most students? Remember, usually we see that 80% of all students benefit from the universal or core instruction. The second key element is the use of evidence-based practices. This means that teachers will use instructional methods that have gone through rigorous peer review processes and are known to be effective with the age and the specific learning needs of the students in that class. Another important component of evidence-based practices is the need to develop the practice with fidelity. That means that teachers will use the evidence-based practice or deliver their instruction in the manner in which the developer recommended. There are many evidence-based practices to choose from. Progress monitoring is another hallmark of RTI. Progress monitoring means that teachers will use reliable and valid testing instruments based on the standards of their subject area to frequently assess student learning. Many schools have common measures so that all students are evaluated 
using the same tools. Many schools use a form of progress monitoring called Curriculum-Based Instruction, or CBM. CBM should reflect the content being directly taught so that a student's progress or lack of progress can be identified and changes in instruction can be made. Here's an example. At the top of the slide is the data from a child who is exceeding expectations, and the bottom shows a student who's not making progress. Finally, data-driven decision-making is a key element of any teaching in RTI. Teachers should use data derived from their CBMs and other assessment instruments to evaluate student progress and make instructional decisions. Placements should never be made without the use of several reliable data points. Let's take a look at a few examples. This graph shows the number of words read correctly, and by taking a look at the data points, we see that the number of words read correctly is increasing each week. So this student is making progress in reading. The graph you are looking at shows a student who, in these short reading probes that last only a few minutes, had a rate of reading words correctly that exceeded the goal or standard. That is the expectation that we have for students' progress. Therefore, this CBMs that this student is making adequate progress within the Tier 1 intervention. Here you see a little bit of a different story. Let's take a closer look at this graph. This student is not making adequate progress. This student started out the year at a level that was consistent with achievement expectations, but did not make progress at as the weeks went on, and you do see that during weeks 6, 7, and 8, the student was performing below the goal. Therefore, the Tier 1 instruction was not effective, and this student needs extra instruction or Tier 2 interventions. The beautiful thing about curriculum-based measures is that the data are instructionally relevant and a school that collects CBMs demonstrates accountability because monitoring each student and takes responsibility for all learners making progress. Effective RTI schools rely heavily on problem solving based on student data. To be most effective, a team approach is recommended for problem solving within an RTI framework. We introduced this earlier when I mentioned that decisions are made by teams, including both general and special educators, and others such as an administrator, reading specialist, and parents. Using the CBM data, teams answer the question, is there a problem, or a reason to be concerned about a child's level of achievement? It is not left to speculation, but it's left up to data. If data show there is a problem, then the problem solving team determines why the problem is happening or why it is that the child is not learning and is expected. When this happens, the next step is to come up with a tier two intervention. Tier two intervention is the answer to the question what should be done about the low achievement in order to catch the child up with age level expectations. Finally, the fourth step is to collect more CBM data to answer the question, is the Tier 2 intervention working? And you can see the process is ongoing. Answering the fourth question leads back to the first question. In using this problem-solving model, it's critical that educators precisely define the problem, explore different solutions, and settle on the intervention with greatest potential for student success. In RTI schools, there are interventions that are called standard protocol interventions. That means that educators have developed specific ways to deal with certain problems that evidence shows 
have a high probability of success when using these methods. For example, poor readers in the early grades often need extra instruction in phonics, and there are standard ways to teach phonics so that it's not as if a school team needs to reinvent the wheel for every child. Thus, several students in Tier 2, let's say for instance in the second grade, who may receive small group instruction using an evidence-based phonics curriculum for five days a week, 30 minutes a day. They would also continue to receive the Tier 1 intervention or reading instruction provided to all second grade children. But of course, nothing works for every child every time. So it's important that teachers monitor and assess intervention outcomes. And if the child is not improving, to try something different. Here's another example of data that teams would review. Take a look at this one. You see it is data on several children and it reflects accuracy and fluency in single digit addition and subtraction. The rectangles on the graph are the zones of achievement that students are expected to demonstrate if they are making adequate progress. As you can see, the class as a whole did very well with all kids meeting or exceeding criteria by the end of the fifth. But there is one child in light blue named Kia, whose progress has fallen below expectations for several weeks. And therefore, Kia would be a good candidate for Tier 2 intervention. Now here's another one. What story does this graph tell? Take a good look. What are your thoughts? Here's the answer. Sierra was not making adequate progress with Tier 1 instruction. At the ninth week, the school team initiated Tier 2 instruction. Tier 2 instruction was very successful because by the 14th week, Syria, Sierra had caught up with grade level expectations, as signified by the goal line. Let's take a look at how one school has benefited from RTI. Hi, I'm Ed Shapiro, Director of the Center for Promoting Research to Practice at Lehigh University. And today's program is about response to intervention. Are you doing it, Emma? Good job. I see lots of children who have the absolute front card. Response to intervention is a methodology that we're using for school-wide change. It's not about kids that are struggling, it's not about kids that are doing great, but it's about all kids. In every school, the principal and the staff members are faced in serving a population, a very diverse population of learners. So we have students that come in again prepared for school and students that are struggling. And you want to bridge the gap for those students so that they're able to achieve. RTI has several critical components. It starts with what is known as universal screening. That's when we assess every student in the school to find out which students are currently doing as expected and which students are not doing as expected. My role is to actually get a day to team together that will be dibbling and we go into the classrooms within a day I can possibly have two grade levels done and I actually have, can start looking at how I can put these skills groups together. I'm actually looking at the needs of the students. We provide reading instruction at three tiers, three levels. All students receive instruction at tier one and that's the core curriculum. All kids are put into core reading groups for 90 minutes a day with their regular passing teacher. Students who are tier one, students who are benchmark, get enrichment activities. They get activities that enhance what they're already getting in their core reading program. Students who are in tier two go into different kinds of strategic interventions. They might be doing programs that involve comprehension or fluency building, 
specific kind of programs that are designed for kids that have those kinds of skill needs. We also know that some of those kids that are placed into Tier 2 may not respond as well as we would like. For those kids, we move to a more intensive kind of intervention, that's Tier 3. How's that sound? Smaller groups, more intensive work, because these are kids that are clearly at risk for failing academically. And we know that if we put these in place correctly, we're likely to get good outcomes. Hence, response to intervention. We're looking for kids to respond to these interventions. And then based on the data, kids are put into 30-minute intervention skill groups. And this is an example of that. I'll tell you what, I am extremely impressed with what I see. Are you sure you haven't done this lesson before? I would like you to please bring us the word twirl. T-W-I-R-L. You are absolutely correct. This story is a biography. It's a smaller group, so it's a smaller setting, and I can kind of guide my instruction off of what they need to be working on, and I can kind of scaffold what they're doing and pull them through as their ability is ready to take them. They're paired with somebody who is close on their level, so they're able to promote a friendly, um, system where they're able to compete at the same level and push each other. We know the younger we get kids, the younger we correct problems kids are having, the better chance we have of not having those kids have those problems later on in their school life and later on into their young adult and adolescent lives. It's important that we know exactly where our students are headed. We need to have a vision for our students. We need to know where they are and where they need to be. And we use data to make instructional decisions to make sure that students do make gains and meet our goals, objectives, and visions. Teams meet to look at those data on a monthly basis. And from those data, decisions are made about how students are doing, if they're responding to the intervention, or if students are still struggling despite the interventions we're putting in place. Data-driven collection of students' progress substantiates for the child it's not fake, it's not just well-intentioned. This is an actual demonstration. Here's where you were, here's where you ended up. Because teachers are working with students in, and analyzing their specific skill needs, they're able to design instruction for each student. And definitely, from the data, I feel that this is being very successful. And they really want to be their best. And when they see the graph going up, they really are excited and they want to do even better the next time. Good job. I can have one more to go. Yeah, that was very good. Excellent job. This is impressive because it's a, a whole school coming together using data in, in ways they, they really hadn't before. Um, looking at all students in, in all, all grades and uh, regardless of any type of identification. And not only do we identify which kids need services, but what kinds of services they need. By having data drive what children receive those programs, this is the difference that occurred with RTI. The key to the success here is that there is collaboration amongst the, the teachers, the literacy coach, the entire staff. When you talk to teachers now, when you hear their conversations, it's about student learning. <laughs> <laughs> After a year of putting this in place, what we find is very strong gains, particularly at kindergarten and first grade. The key phrase in response to intervention is response. How well are students responding to changes in the curriculum. The ultimate goal is to help kids become better readers and that's what we're seeing. With my reading skills group I've noticed um, an increase between 20 to 30 words beyond what they started with. I see a change in my parents as they get good clear information and data about their own students and their own children. They can see the results, the children can see the results and the teachers know that when they're teaching they're doing the right thing. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Bye. Bye. We love to read. One school might choose to do 30 minutes a day of tiered intervention five days a week. Another school might choose to do that three days a week. The basic model is the same. 
but the flexibility that's there for each school to put together the model that fits their context is also part of RTI. In order to make changes in the curriculum, we need to work together as a team to ensure that students are making expected gains. I know school officials and teachers are busy, but once again, achievement is the name of the game and high achievement is the priority. And the RTI model does exactly that, and this really melded with what I personally believe is the best way to instruct children and what schools need today. When I came here and started doing this, this intervention, I, it was a feeling I had that I was really making a difference. And that is what was important to me. RTI is about helping every child learn to read, learn to do math. This is about solving a big problem, it's solving the problem of literacy. What we're trying to do here is look at education in a different way. In the past, special education operated in one arena and regular education operated in another. One of the things that Dr. Volbrick and I have focused on is bring together the special ed world and the regular ed world so that we can look at the long-term benefits for all students, not just special education students or regular education students. We can bring all kinds of services without labeling a youngster to that youngster to see that they succeed in school, and that's really what it's all about. I've been in education now for almost 30 years, and this is the most important work I've ever been involved in. Now, what kind of C does this look like? <laughs> I really believe that we can make a real difference in the lives of kids through this process. I learned reading like um, when I was in kindergarten and it was really exciting to learn how to read. I love to read. Dozens of schools throughout our state have visited our pilot sites here in Pennsylvania. We would encourage you to do the same. Go ahead and begin. We hope that we can provide an opportunity to see, hear, and really understand what RTI could possibly do for your school.